Okay, I am super excited about the next speaker. I am having a hard time staying inside of my sneakers. So one of the things that we talk about a lot at home on our channel, and we get some flack for it, is I always say that, like, hey, our, our little kids shouldn't have a choice in what they eat, or at least they shouldn't be given bad choices, because you get people like, hey, like, my kids will only eat chicken nuggets and macaroni and cheese. And, like, I'm like, why do they have that choice? And the next speaker is someone who is amazing. And she talks so much about what we can do for our children. And she's got a viral TikTok channel that makes me go, like, I don't know how to cook. Right. And she does everything that you, she does everything live. Yeah. Right? Doesn't matter. There's a mistake live. Because that is life, right? right? And she is showing us her children's lunch boxes every single day. So it's not just like, hey, I would love for kids to eat better. She's showing us how to actually achieve that. And I'm so excited to She's to got an amazing her. story. Yeah, she really does. So Abby started the ketogenic lifestyle in 2017 after doing just about every other diet. She was consistently losing weight and then would gain it right back on the weekend. Sound familiar? Because that like totally resonates with me. She found it hard to stick to other diets because she was always hungry and having cheat meals. She thought she could exercise the pounds away. After weeks of research, she finally decided to give keto a try, but vowed it would only be for six weeks. After week one and the surge of energy, focus, and results she saw, she was hooked. Abby has lost over 130 pounds and 145 inches. While Abby is very passionate about the ketogenic lifestyle, she credits all of her success to the revelation God gave her about stewarding her body. She was able to acknowledge she had a food addiction and was using food to cope with trauma from from childhood, depression, and anxiety. It was when she was diagnosed with postpartum depression after the birth of her son that she was at her lowest, lowest point in life. Feeling suicidal and lost, she had an encounter with her savior, Jesus Christ. Can we, I mean, I'm so excited. That changed everything. She now stands firm against her addiction, knowing that self-control and discipline is a fruit of the Spirit, and the more time she spends with God, the better it'll get, and that anything that we put before God is out of order, including food. She now spends her time sharing her family's faith, ketogenic lifestyle, and helping others get freedom from food addiction. While she loves helping people through her business, she is fully confident that it is not a meal plan or grocery list that is helping people. It is the power of her testimony and encouragement of others to place God first, to allow him to meet their needs instead of reliance on comfort foods. It is such a blessing for us to introduce our Christian sister, Abby from House of Keto. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you uh, to everyone. Thank you, Chris and Miriam, uh, for having me. Can we just clap for them? Like everything that they're doing for the keto community and they're doing it in such uh, a delicious way. So uh, thank you guys uh, for that. I'm still not uh, sure why they asked me to speak. Um, if you heard uh, Two Crazy Ketos, I don't have any credentials. I'm not a doctor. I am not a nutritionist. I have no special letters uh, behind my name. Um, what I stand on is my experience and what I've been through um, over the last five years and um, how I've been able um, to help people I mean, like, as they mentioned, um, that experience and that encounter that I had with God. And you might be thinking, I came here to talk about keto. I didn't come here for a sermon. Don't worry. I'm not a preacher. I'm not a minister. This is from my own uh, personal experience. So I'm going to ask you guys to just go with me for a moment um, and just give me a chance. I'm going to tell you guys just a little bit um, about me. These are uh, my two children. That is uh, Penelope. She is 12. Uh, and my son, Huxley, he is six. Um, as they mentioned about my kids, we actually started my kids on keto about four years ago. My son was uh, just about two. He was nonverbal. Uh, he barely spoke at all. His diet consisted of goldfish, Tootsie Rolls, and syrup, Dr. Pepper, and whipped cream. Um, and I thought that I was doing a good job because the pediatrician said, well, he's growing, so let him eat whatever he wants to eat. So I went out to Aldi and bought all the sugar-free syrup that I could find um, and thought, well, I'm doing better because I'm switching him to sugar-free syrup, so this should be great. Um, we watched the movie Magic Pill. 
And the little girl in that film, her name was Abby also, and her diet was better than my son's diet was. At the time, I had already been helping other people for about a year, and as I'm watching this video, it's obviously amazing, uh, but I felt God speak to me, and I felt him tell me, this is how you're going to help your son. Um, and in that moment, I started to cry, not because God was speaking to me, because I was terrified. Um, like, I felt like I was barely helping myself, I was just starting to help other people, but God really impressed on me that I was going to use this way of eating to help my son. Uh, we changed his diet. Uh, we removed everything from the house that was not uh, keto-friendly, low-carb, sugar-free. Um, and the way we did that was just by not replenishing everything. So I didn't make an announcement, here he, here he, we are all now keto. I just stopped buying it. Um, so when my daughter asked for Chef Boyardee, mom must have forgot it at the store. Easy Mac, forgot it, I'll put it down on the list. And it just never came back into the house. About a week and a half to two weeks in, my son Huxley started speaking. Um, and about three to four weeks in, it was full sentences. And now uh, the kid never stops talking. He literally never stops talking. Um, and I just love it because it's such a reminder of God's faithfulness. My prayers uh, for months, we started out with him just eating sauce and cheese and he has worked up to where he eats salmon, he eats ribeye and he eats burgers. So that's what he packs in his lunch. Um, he doesn't eat anything else. He doesn't do the fruit, he doesn't do the vegetables and we don't push that on him. And his teacher said, you know, your son is bringing um, salmon and packet salt, uh, packets of salt in his lunchbox. I said, yeah, he likes to salt his own food. So we pack little packets of red mints uh, in his lunchbox. That's his fun part uh, because his is pretty boring with uh, what he is eating. We also have uh, two keto puppies. We have Oliver and Turbo, um, and they have been keto their entire life. So literally, if you live in my house, as for me in my house, we do not eat sugar. So um, you will not find it in our house. And they mentioned we have a little bit of trouble online sometimes. I've had my account on uh, TikTok and Instagram banned for uh, child abuse because I wasn't packing uh, little Debbie's in my kids' lunchbox. Um, my daughter's going to school with uh, steak and ribeye and shrimp and lobster is one of her favorite. The girl eats lobster like chicken fingers, okay? It's... It's expensive, okay, but I'm not buying uh, Go-Gurts. I'm not buying uh, fruit cups. I don't need to get her a snack to hold her over every time we get in the car, so I'll spend the money on lobster. Um, but we get that type of feedback a lot, and I just remember to stay focused because these are my children, um, and it's my responsibility to steward them, and that's what uh, God has called me to do. Um, I mentioned... We share our entire lives on Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook for the last five years. I've lost 130 pounds. At my heaviest, I was 260 pounds, a size 20 and a size 4X. Um, so I'm really thankful for this way of eating. Um, I do live cooking shows um, and share easy recipes. I am also not a chef. So not only am I not a doctor, nutritionist, or any type of specialist, I'm also not a chef. So I really don't know why I'm up here. But for some reason, people just watch and I just go with it. So if we start cooking and my meat is a little older than I thought it was, you guys are going to see me live find something else to make. And it's real life. Um, we share keto with our kids, keto with dogs. Um, and then again, our entire house is keto. So we have multiple refrigerators and freezers. They feel like children to me. I just love them so much to be able to offer that uh, to my children. But I also started helping people in group challenges um, where I would talk about my story and talk about my testimony. Um, because again, in this encounter with God, I really felt like... Um, part of my responsibility was to help others. It wasn't just for me. God does leave the 99 to find the one, but he's always concerned about people. So anything good that we see in our lives is not just for us, it's something um, that we need to share. So that's why I'm gonna be talking today about this topic of freedom from food addiction because it's something that I'm extremely passionate about. Now, I am going to be sharing from the Bible and some of you might not like the Bible. Maybe you don't read the Bible, that's fine. I am not uh, like a Bible pusher. I'm not here to shove religion down your throat. I'm just here to speak from my experience. So if you're one of those people that don't like the Bible, do me a favor and just go with me and uh, the same way you've seen all the professionals up here putting up their the really small print. I don't know why the print is so small on those metaphors journals. I cannot see it. It's like, I think they just want to tell us, here's what's happening, and we're just supposed to trust and believe. So just act like uh, that's what I'm putting up um, on the screen when you see that. So we are going to jump in right here uh, in the beginning uh, in the Bible with the story of Adam and Eve. In Genesis 3, verses 6 and 7, it says, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and she ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her 
and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. We're going to skip down to verse uh, 21. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Now we're going to come back to this, but I just want to point out something here because it just said that they had already clothed themselves with fig leaves. But then God makes clothes for them. So we're going to come back to that. In verse 23, so the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. Adam and Eve are walking in the garden every single solitary day with God, the creator of everything, the creator of the universe. And it was food. You guys, it wasn't even a Cinnabon. It was fruit, okay? That's the hardest thing that I am having to settle with this story. I love blackberries, but I don't know if there is a blackberry around that would be worth it for me to make this decision, but still, somehow they made this decision. Could you imagine walking with God every single solitary day, naked and being okay with it, and now you gotta leave? Like, that's, that's a lot. So before we jump into everything, I'm gonna pray real quick because I need it. Uh, this is what I do when I'm uh, giving my talks in my private challenge groups um, because I want you guys to really not just hear what it is I have to say or my opinion. Um, so I'm just gonna do that real quick. So God, I just thank you for this moment. God, I thank you for this moment in time. God, I thank you for taking a time in my life that was dark and it was hopeless. God, I thank you for keeping your word, keeping your promise that you would take my pain and turn it into purpose. God, I ask that as I speak today, God, that it wouldn't be me, but it would be you speaking through me. God, give me the words to say when I need to say them. And God, let it resonate in the hearts of those that need it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So I grew up in a really, really big family. Um, one of eight kids, we were homeschooled, and we grew up in kind of a, a, a weird church. I won't go into all of that, but it was, it was a little weird, um, some weird things. And um, my brothers and sisters and I, we used to eat my mom's snacks. We just thought she wouldn't realize it. We'd even go as far as to put the empty box back in the pantry. And my kids do it to this day, and I still don't get it. But we thought somehow this is the way to get away with it, just put the box in there, and when it's empty. I don't know about you guys, but I get more upset when I grab it and it's empty because I go with all my strength and it just flings out and now I feel like a failure and someone has duped me by eating all of my snacks. We used to do it to my mom all the time. Well, I never understood why she didn't just buy more with eight kids. We all like chips, mom. We all like tasty cakes, like bring enough for everyone. She didn't. So we get in trouble because someone ate them. No one would fess up to who had eaten the snacks. She waits all day for my dad to come home. She tells my dad, of course, we get in trouble. Now with eight kids, I don't necessarily know that I blame them, but my parents had this group uh, punishment style that they like to try to go with to teach us to work together as a team and you guys all you know, do this or you all win or you all fail. And sometimes it was individual, but they tried this for a while and I think they saw that it didn't really uh, work out that well. But that night, my dad was really upset with us and we all got in trouble. All of us lost dessert because someone would not fess up to who had eaten uh, my mom's snacks. And that's really the context of Genesis 3. Eve eats the fruit and now we all have to pay the price. For some, that is a struggle with anger. Maybe that's a struggle with pride. Maybe that's a struggle with gambling. Uh, for some, it's drug addiction. Maybe it's alcohol addiction. For myself, it was food addiction. And that's what I'm here to talk about today. Now, when you saw the title of this presentation, you probably thought, this has nothing to do with me. I'm not a food addict. I'm just trying to lose weight. Seems like uh, I'm going a little bit far. So I'm gonna give you guys just um, a little background on what food addiction is. Again, I'm probably gonna say this 100 times, y'all. I'm not a doctor. I have no special letters behind my name. Okay, so I grabbed all of this stuff off of trusty Google, the same place that you guys can go um, and find it as well. But real quickly, we'll go through this. And then if you guys have any questions, I won't be here for Q&A, so you can ask uh, the professionals if I am uh, right about this. So what is food addiction? Food addiction involves the same areas of the brain as drug addiction. Also the same neurotransmitters are involved and many of the symptoms are identical. Processed junk foods have a powerful effect on the reward centers of the brain. These effects are caused by brain neurotransmitters like dopamine. 
The most problematic foods include typical junk foods like candy, soda, bread, baked goods, pasta, Cinnabon, uh, Wetzel Pretzel, Aunt Annie's. I don't know about you guys, Aunt Annie's is my favorite, but they're talking about her right now. Uh, the main symptoms of food addiction include craving and binging on unhealthy foods without being hungry and an inability to resist the urge to eat these foods. Now, I might have about 10% of you convinced that maybe this is something that you deal and struggle with, but we still might be thinking, others of us might still be thinking, am I an addict? So let's find out. These are some of the uh, questions that I found that they would ask before actually diagnosing you uh, with this. So, do you have frequent cravings for certain foods despite feeling full and having just finished a nutritious meal? So, I don't know about you guys, but in my house, we were famous for... My dad makes dinner, we eat, and as soon as he's done, everyone says, I could go for something sweet. That's what that is right there. Starting to eat a craved food and often eating too much more than intended. Eating a craved food and sometimes eating to the point of feeling excessively stuffed. often feeling guilty after eating particular foods, yet eating them again soon after. These all sound like me. I don't know about you guys, so I might just be talking to me today, but these all sound like me. Sometimes making excuses about why responding to a food craving is a good idea. Repeatedly, but unsuccessfully, trying to quit eating certain foods or setting rules for eating them, or setting rules for when eating them is allowed, such as cheat meals or on certain days. Often hiding the consumption of unhealthy foods from others. I don't know about you guys, but this is a big one for me. I used to buy my kids snacks all the time, and they don't even know that I did it because I ate them before they got home. And then I had to go back out and buy more. So that one was me right there. When I saw that, I'm like, yep, that's your girl. It's me. Next one, feeling unable to control the consumption of unhealthy foods despite knowing that they cause physical harm or weight gain. So are you an addict? Maybe, maybe not, but it's something you have to think about. I know it might sound heavy to come here thinking you're just going to hear all about the science behind keto and now you have someone telling you that you're an addict. And an addict is a pretty heavy word. But we're going to, as we go on in our talk, I'm going to show you guys why um, it's not your fault. So my own uh, personal story, obviously I had gotten to a point where I was extremely heavy. At, I'm Barely 5'2 on a good day. My doctor told me to stop lying and telling people I was 5'3. Um, but what does she know? Anyway, right? Um, but I'm 5'2, 260 pounds, uh, size 4X, size 20 pants. And the majority of my weight, I kind of, I was my mom's smallest baby, and I don't know how I ended up being the one that was the most overweight. It kind of seems unfair, right? Uh, but my entire life, I feel like I had just been overweight. But it really reached its peak after I had uh, my youngest, Huxley, who's six now. Uh, I gained about 60 pounds in about five and a half, six months breastfeeding. Uh, my postpartum depression was horrible. I had dealt with some stuff, like I mentioned, we grew up in a kind of strange church, so there was a little weirdness going on, and it was, felt a little bit uh, traumatic. But when I had Huxley, it felt like everything just compounded. I had this child that was looking for me and wanting to breastfeed like every five minutes, and I had to change the diaper, and then it was time to feed again. It was just a lot. My depression and anxiety came to its, its rearing head. I didn't want to leave the house for almost three years, you guys. I didn't leave my house. Everywhere that I went, I needed someone to go with me because my anxiety was just that bad. I got to the point where I was embarrassed to leave the house. I was embarrassed to go places with my daughter. She was in uh, kindergarten, and... She was going on field trips, and I wanted to go, but did they have somewhere for me to sit down? You guys, I had busted my flip-flops because my feet and my legs had grown so big so quickly. Um, I couldn't zip up my boots, and all of this was happening, again, so quickly. I had to call ahead to places to see if they had somewhere for me to sit down because I wasn't going to be able to walk. But I got to this place where I was desperate for a change, just desperate. Something had to change because I felt like I didn't want to be alive anymore. And I found myself sitting in my closet, 
trying to make a decision. Do I take my life before my daughter comes home from school or do I make her dinner and do it after? That's a moment that I'll never forget and I've prayed that God never lets that feeling of that moment leave me because it helps me to identify with people that are still there in that moment right now. Some of you in here might identify with waking up this morning and as Ben mentioned, we should be grateful that our heart is beating. But me, there were days that I would wake up and I was pissed off that I was alive again because I had to live in this body that I hated. I had to live in this space in my mind that felt dark and lonely and there was no one there. In that moment in my closet, I'll never forget, I heard God ask me what my name was and my name is Abigail and it means father's joy and I was so bothered by that because at the time my dad and I didn't have a good relationship but God just kept saying to me, it means you are my joy. And I was so intrigued by that because what do you mean? How do you find joy in me? Do you see me? Do you see how I'm eating? Do you see how I'm hiding food? Do you see what I have become? And it was that question that I had in my heart of God, what is it that you see in me that got me out of the closet that day and put me on a journey that I just wanted to know who is this God and why does he think this about me? I honestly thought God was crazy. I didn't want to see him as a father because my father, at the time, our relationship wasn't that great. I started to spend more time with God and not in this super, let's sit down and pray and read the Bible for an hour at a time, but just listening to songs about who God says that I am. And as I began to let those words wash over me, it began to wash my mind. It began to cancel out the lies that the enemy had been telling me that I was worthless, that I didn't deserve to be alive, that my weight was an inconvenience. I took up too much space in this world, that nobody loved me. When I began to repeat the things that God said about me, it changed my mindset. The more time that I spent with him, the easier it got to be able to stick to my plan. And I will not tell you there weren't days where Cinnabon was still Cinnabon, but it became easier. And people have always asked me, what is my secret? And that's the only answer that I can give because that has been my secret. There's a huge connection that I found with the clients that I help there's something that has happened to them when they were a child. Whether it be there was abuse in their childhood, they moved around a lot, they had parents that argued, they had someone that made them feel unsafe. And a lot of times we sit and we think that the reason that we're in the position right now is because food is delicious and I like to eat it. And I still agree with that statement because food is delicious and I like to eat it, as long as you season it right, okay? But it's delicious, and I like to eat it. I will never stand up here and tell you guys that Brussels sprouts taste better than Cinnabon. Because all of y'all know it's not true. Could you eat the Brussels sprouts? Yes. But does Cinnabon taste better? Yes. And I'm not going to stand up here and lie to you guys, because it does taste better. Okay? But the thing that I learned is that I learned this coping skill of using food to meet a need that I had because I had to find a way to survive. I just uh, mentioned that there. In childhood, we need to be able to have a firm understanding that we are safe. A lot of us didn't feel safe in our bodies as a child. And as a result, we started using food. Maybe it was our mom or dad was buying us ice cream to cover up for um, an alcoholic binge that they went on. Or you had an abusive parent and to fix it, they got your favorite dessert or they took you to McDonald's. But in a young age, we start to learn, when I feel this way, when I feel unsafe, this is what I do. And that's exactly what I had done. But I want to tell you that those things that happened to you, they were things that were done to you. And it's sin. When someone mistreats you, when a caregiver is not giving you the love and the attention and the affection that they're supposed to be giving you, it is sin. And you might be thinking, well, Abby, sin sounds like a really hard word. I thought you said you weren't going to preach to us. Sin is simply missing the mark. If I'm supposed to stand here and I stand here, it's sin. It's simply missing the mark. It doesn't mean that you have malice and that you're an evil person. It's simply missing the mark. And it's not necessarily because of our sin. All of these things in childhood, we didn't have control over that. Just like with the story of Adam and Eve, that had absolutely nothing to do with us, God. I wasn't even there, and now it's got to hurt every time I have a baby? That doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't seem fair. 
but I'm suffering a consequence because of someone else's sin. So this is not your fault. Being a food addict and accepting that shouldn't feel heavy. We have a name, and everything that has a name has to submit to the power of God. But this is why so many of us fail, because we're not addressing the root issue. So I could lose 130 pounds, but if I didn't deal with the emotional issues, I would be right back in the same position. As soon as life hit, as soon as my coworker at work drove me crazy and my boss didn't do anything about it, he just gave me more work because I was efficient. As soon as that family relationship started breaking down again and mom starts acting crazy, I would be right back in the same position that I was in. And that stuff that happened to you, it's real. It hurt. You had every right to protect yourself. I'm not here to minimize that. That person that did that thing to you, they shouldn't have done that. It is sin. It's not your fault. But it is your responsibility. And we took on that responsibility by finding a way to cope. Some of us choose to fill it with food. Some of us do drugs. Some of us do alcohol. Some of us do gambling. Some of us do Target. Some of us do Amazon. Some of us do our local firearm store. Pick your, pick your poison, okay? Now, I love all those things, all of them. But if I'm, taking, if I'm taking those things and putting them in a place that God desires to be, then it's out of order. God desires to fill those needs that we have. You are worthy of love. You are worthy of protection. You are worthy of safety and security. You are worthy of all of those things. But every time that I took food and I put it in the place of those things, I cheapened myself. Could you imagine? I'm a mom. I don't know how many of you guys are parents, but it kills me when I hear one of my children say something bad about themselves. I'm like, first of all, you came from me, so we're not going to say that. But second of all, you're amazing. Like, there's so many things that all of us, we think our children are the greatest children in the world. And it kills us when we hear them say something negative about themselves. That's how God feels when we don't believe what he says about us. When we believe that we're worthless, when we believe those lies that that school bully told us, that that teacher told us, that we weren't smart enough, that we would never be anything. Don't even try. Put the book away. You're never going to learn how to read. You'll do this great again. We remember those things. And you hear it come up in people's stories and even celebrities. No matter how much success they've accumulated, they always mention something from their childhood. And it's really interesting when we see that. But God gives us a choice. In Deuteronomy 30, 19, it says, This day I call the heavens and earth as witness against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curse. Now choose life so that you and your children may live. God is amazing that he gives us a choice. Just like Adam and Eve in the garden had a choice. I don't know about you guys, but if I was God, I'd probably make everybody pick me. I don't think I would let people have the choice. Like, I'm in charge of everything. I'll make everybody love me. But God loves us so much that he gives us that autonomy to be able to choose. And he offers us everything that we need. It talks about in the Bible that God, he is the bread of life. In John 6, verse 32, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. Verse 33, for the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. In verse 35, then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never grow hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Isn't it amazing that bread is what's killing us? Is that, is that weird? No, I'm not saying that bread is the enemy. I don't think that Cinnabon is the devil because it's delicious. Y'all don't forget that. Cinnabon is delicious. If you learn nothing from me today, Cinnabon is delicious. But the enemy has a counterfeit for every good and perfect thing that God has for us because he wants to cheapen us and keep us from being able to go to God. And anything that we take and put in a place that God desires to be, what would that be called? That would be an idol idolatry. Idolatry is putting something, anything before God. It's giving time, affection, space, and worship to the created and not the creator. Imagine 
you're, you got a coworker. I know all of you guys got a coworker. You got somebody in mind when I say you're, you're just ticked off. You, you, someone comes into your mind. Maybe it's your spouse. Maybe it's your sister. Maybe it's your kids. But imagine she's driving you crazy at work, and you get home, and the first thing that you do is grab the bag of Doritos, grab the Pringles, you grab a Snickers, you got a Coke, you sit down, and you're on the couch watching TV. For me, it would probably be Real Housewives. That's just my show. You're just sitting there and you're just eating. You're just putting food in your mouth. Now you are ticked off at Susan at work. You're also ticked off at your boss. You're just angry and upset. Now imagine Jesus sitting right next to you on the couch. Jesus Christ, the comforter, the prince of peace sits beside you. Just like a parent who's restrained from rescuing a drowning child, Jesus is there waving his arms to help you, but you can't see him because your face is buried in those delicious snacks. Imagine how that breaks his heart when he has something so much greater to offer you. Why does this matter? Because our freedom depends on it. You could accept all of the medical research that we've gotten. You could even learn to recite it yourself. I hate to say, those are not gonna be the things that keep you successful. There might be people that try keto and they need to lose 10 or 15 pounds and they can eat a couple steaks and sticks of butter and hot dogs and they're good to go. Those are not the people that are battling with food addiction. So this does not apply to everyone. But if any of those things that I said sound true, if you keep doing the thing that you don't want to do, just like Paul talks about in the Bible, there might be a bigger issue here. And the really cool thing about accepting that is you get to take that weight off of you. Because what I'm saying here is I'm giving you an excuse. And if you guys know me, I'm not a person to give excuses. I'm a straightforward person. This is your fault. You ate the meal. You didn't track it. That's me. So for me to say this, this is not your fault. And when we accept that, it allows us to be able to find freedom. But sometimes we make excuses. Well, it's just chocolate cake. It's just Cinnabon. It's not crack. I just want to feel good about myself. That's not a crime. Why does eating even matter to God? Don't they serve donuts at church? Some churches got wine and crackers, y'all. Why would it be an issue if you're eating food? Why? It says in Jeremiah 2.13, my people have committed two sins. Now remember, sin is just missing the mark. It doesn't mean you guys are out here committing murder and killing dogs. Just that you've missed the mark. Maybe you weren't as nice to somebody. Maybe you gave someone a pet while you were driving. You threw up a favorite finger or whatever. You just missed the mark. You didn't show kindness and love. My people have committed two sins. They've forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns broken cisterns that cannot hold water. This verse reminds me of the story of Adam and Eve when they made the coverings from fig leaves that couldn't cover them. It didn't work. So the food is not going to work. Cinnabon is not going to work because you're gonna have one and then you're gonna need another. You're gonna be successful. You're gonna lose 10 pounds and then you'll be sitting right back in the same position next week with a Cinnabon again, wondering how in the world you got there. If we put anything before God, we're missing out on all that he has for us. And we need his help because we can't do it on our own. But in idolatry, we abandon that help. Now, if you're starting to feel bad, I know none of us have never actually bowed down to a Cinnabon. We wouldn't physically bow down to food, but we do it so often in our actions. And I know this message feels hard and heavy, and it is because this is something that God has convicted me on and called me to speak to. But there's a vast difference between conviction and condemnation. Condemnation is from the enemy, and it makes us feel like the dog who just peed on the carpet that gets beaten in the nose with the newspaper. Condemnation separates us from God and says that we've gone too far or we might as well just give up. But conviction is sweet. It does sting a little bit. It might hurt to hear, maybe I'm a food addict. But the sting is quickly soothed by our gracious God. So you have to learn to give yourself grace. In Titus 2, 11 and 12, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness, worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. Now I point out grace here, but I also point out training. You know what that tells me? We're not gonna get it right the first time. I might have two Cinnabons tomorrow, who knows? But God's training, he offers training with his grace and also self-control. In Jonah 2.8, those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. We get to choose how we handle this thing. And if we choose wrong, we could forfeit the grace that God gives us. How do you fix it? God offers us freedom from this putting food in its proper place. You can enjoy it, but don't use it to nourish. I'm sorry, you can enjoy it. 
That's not the sin. You can use it to fuel and nourish your body, but don't allow it to rule over you. Take it to God instead of to the fridge for a temporary fix. Take it to God. In 2 Corinthians 3.17, now the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. If you wanna get out of this thing, that's the answer right there. God offers us self-control. And 2 Timothy 1.7, for God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power of love and self-control. Spit it out. Don't chew it out. Talk about it. The Bible talks about us overcoming by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony, Revelations 12, 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. That's exactly what I'm doing right now, guys. Just like an alcoholic who's constantly in recovery, as a food addict, I'll constantly be in recovery. So whether you agree with this talk or not, I'm walking out what I'm supposed to do. This is the word of my testimony and it helps me to be able to overcome. Find a friend or therapist or someone that you can talk to. You don't have to burden you know, uh, your spouse or someone. If it makes you feel more comfortable to go to someone that you don't know, do that. I go to therapy every single solitary week, every week. And my therapist knows if she has anyone that cancels and she wants to make some money, call your girl because I always got something to talk about, okay? <laughs> always got something to talk about. Take your problems to the creator first, not the created. This is his mess. That's like, can I speak to the manager lingo right there? Let me speak to the person in charge. What am I going to go and curse this person out for or go get some food? God made all of it. It's all under his rule. Ask him to show you where it started. Ask him to show you, where did it start? Where did it start? Ask him to show you that greatest source of pain. And this might sound scary because when you ask someone to give up their comfort and peace, when I say, hey, let's not do sugar, it doesn't just sound like sugar. It sounds like giving up your comfort and peace. And that might sound scary. It feels a lot like going to sleep at night without a front door. You wouldn't do that, especially if you live in a bad neighborhood. All your stuff will be gone. But when we use food, as a protection, it's like having no front door or better yet, one of those screen things that lady walks on in, in TV, she can't ever open the door. They sell it on the buy now thing. It's supposed to keep the bugs out, but it's just horrible. It's really, really bad. But the front door that we've put up is like a screen. It's like those fig leaves that Adam and Eve used. But God comes in and he covers us. He offers us a door. God is literally everything that we need. He shows up as a promise keeper in Numbers 23, 19. He shows up as my great defender in Psalms 50, verse 6. He's merciful in Deuteronomy 4, 31. God is always there in 2 Chronicles 39. He's compassionate and gracious in Psalms 116, 5. He's my comforter in Isaiah 61, 1 through 3, and John 14, 26. He is love in John 1, 16. He never changes in Malachi 3, 6. He's not fickle like that friend of mine that won't call me back but is posting on Instagram. He never changes. He's the prince of peace. He can offer me peace in the middle of whatever it is that I'm going through. That hug that I needed he holds me tight in Psalm 63, 8. He's my protector and safety in Psalms 18, 2. He fights my fights in Deuteronomy 3, 22. He stands next to me in Joshua 1, 9. He's my helper in Hebrews 13, 6. He's my strength when I can't cope in Isaiah 40, 29. He even dries my tears in Revelations 21, 4. God has everything that we need. Literally everything that we need. Now you might be someone in this room that doesn't believe a word of anything that I've said to you. And that's okay. Hi. But I'm here today to tell you that my life would not be what it is today without the power of God. You heard people earlier today talking about um, breast cancers and tumors disappearing. Two years ago, I was diagnosed with a rare breast disease. It looked like breast cancer, it acted like breast cancer, and it was treated like breast cancer. One of the most painful times of my life. 
everyone that had this disease, they put on a, a low sugar diet and asked them to lose weight. At the time, I couldn't lose any more weight. My head was so big, I would have toppled over. It made no sense why I was sick. I was getting ready at the age of 31 to undergo a double mastectomy. And before I did that, I had to do a round of chemo, even though it wasn't cancer. And I didn't have peace about it. My daughter was scared. She was terrified that I was gonna lose all of my hair. And her fear caused me to pause because I didn't have peace. I prayed and I felt like God called me to fast. I fasted for 21 days with no food, only water. I had a team of 14 doctors from all over the world, Johns Hopkins, University of Maryland, all the top breast cancer specialists. The disease was so rare, less than 1,000 women in the world at the time of my diagnosis had it. They couldn't figure it out. It was an anomaly. But they're getting ready to do this treatment, chemo, and this procedure. And I decided to take a second and pause and say that I know that God is my healer and I needed peace. After 21 days, I went back to my doctor at Johns Hopkins and my largest mass that was six centimeters had shrunk down to less than one centimeter. This had not happened throughout the entire six months that I was battling with this disease. Every single one ruptured and had placed me in the hospital. They were astonished, they didn't know what happened, but I knew what happened. I put aside the comfort of the world. I drowned it all out. And I'm not saying that the fast is what made the tumor disappear because I know you guys might stone me if I do, but I know how I was feeling in my body and I know what God did. He's shown up for me as a healer. He's shown up for me as my comforter, as my protector. And my hope is that as I close this talk today, you're thinking about areas in your own life where someone did you wrong, they did you dirty. A group of your keto friends should go and deal with them right now. Like, you know what, Abby, you just reminded me, that was a pretty horrible teacher. But I'm gonna ask right now, as I close, I'm gonna pray the same way that I do with my group challenge, that God will take you back to that moment and show you, maybe not right now, maybe a week from now, you'll send me a message and you'll say, you know what, Abby, you're right, I saw it. It was Miss Jones, second grade, math room. I'm gonna pray that God will show you that moment and take you back to that, and not just show you, but that he'll meet you there in that moment, and that this journey might get easier for you. God, in this moment right now, I thank you God, I thank you for taking my pain. God, making me a promise and turning it into my purpose. God, you're no respecter of persons in the same way that you did it for me. You can do it for anyone in this room that wants it. God, I ask that you would take them back to that moment. That moment, that source of the, their greatest pain. No matter how silly it might seem to other people, it hurt. But God, I ask that when you show them that, that you wouldn't just show them the pain, you wouldn't just show them that you were there and watching, but God, that you would show them that you were there and experiencing it with them. God, that we can find comfort in knowing that you already know. We don't have to explain or convince someone that they owe us an apology, but the creator of the universe already knows the pain that we're dealing with. God, I ask that you would give self-control and grace. God, that you would allow us to choose life. God, I thank you for this moment. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you guys so much.